Hey, what's going on everyone? Hawks21 here, back with another Splinterlands video. So it's time to check back in with the Splinterlands Madness Tournament. Um, we were in the Sweet 16 for both the Diamond and Silver Tournaments, and we're ready to reveal the Elite 8 after a couple days of very, very intense battling. Uh, I'm going to structure these videos a little different this time. Um, I know who won. Here's the bracket that it looked like for the Sweet 16. I have the names of who advanced here uh, whited out. And we're going to sort of go through uh, matchup by matchup. Just a little spoiler alert. Diamond wasn't too crazy, but silver was absolutely insane. So I'm excited to show you those. Uh, but we're going to start in diamond. So let's check in quickly on the number one seed, the Necromancer versus NCC Charlie. So we'll start here. And yeah. So <laughs> this was actually the third battle uh, in this round. It was best three of five. And as you can see, you know, Charlie puts out a good team, very high quality team, got the core and everything. But Necromancer's coming with Kitty, Desert Dragon, fully leveled up Agor, Carnage Titan, Oshore. There's just not a lot you can do against a lineup like this. And Necromancer is going to clean up this series three to nothing. We'll watch some of this battle. Don't know if we'll watch the whole thing. Just want to show you kind of some of the pure dominance that we've seen in this tournament thus far from the Necromancer. Uh, really showing off uh, the number one seed, you know, showing that he deserves it. You know, Charlie puts up a decent fight here. Again, doing a lot of damage to the Agor in the back. It's not like, you know, this was a blowout or anything. It's just at some point, you know, <laughs> if you're going to play this expensive of wild cards, like it's pretty hard to come up with, you know, better than this. So... Get through the Agor. Oh, wait. Oh, sure has Resurrect. You know, by the time you get through it a second time, even with the Shatter, so the Shatter does a lot of work here. Um, it, it's just too late. Too much of your damage has been wiped out. Yeah, so it gets through it, but, you know, at this point... Too little, too late. Okay. So we are going to reveal here. Necromancer took it. 3-0. He, he moves on to the Elite Eight. Number one seed is through. Here for the 9-8 uh, matchup. It was a really good matchup. Watched all the battles. It went 5 um don't have any battles to show it was you know there's just too many battles here can't pick them all but it was a good battle and the winner was Bo. Or i keep calling bow jangles b jangles um nine seed advances again was a really good matchup five game series hard fought b jangles is gonna have his hands full in the elite eight with the necromancer uh but still he collects the prize for the elite eight uh and we move on okay so this is going to be the first time we look at an entire series. We have Guy from Ajax, who, as you guys know, big upset in the first round, taking down the four seed as the 29 seed. So 29 out of 32 was the biggest underdog to win in the first round in either of the tournaments. Um, you know, there's been a lot of Cinderella stories in the NCAA tournament this year. Is Guy from Ajax going to be ours? Let's check in with this series. So... Gotta restart this one. Okay. So Silent Summoners, which if you remember from round one, that's what got Guy from Ajax through to this round, was dominating two Silent Summoners uh, rule sets. So gets another one right up his alley. Let's see if it works out for him. They both kind of went sneak plays. You know, the, the Earth one is just so, so, so powerful. You know, especially when you're talking about the repair 
um, which we'll see a couple times coming to play in the heel, right? Like this guy's going to make no progress on the chaos agent because of that heel. Yeah. So this, you know, this Kalia team is just too, too powerful. It's, uh, it's hard to match this with any other sneak team. Uh, so Wes took game one. All right. Game two guy from Ajax. This is, I think this is what he did last time too. Came out and said, time for Yasek. Right? Back against the wall. You're an underdog. There's no better summoner to play as an underdog than Yasek. Let's see if this one works out though. That extra speed was big there, right? So the extra speed allowed his Serpentine Spy to go first to do the damage, forced him to get resurrected, which when a monster then gets resurrected, it can't attack that same turn, and then got a little lucky with the scatter shot from Lava Spider, Serpentine Spider is done. Serpentine Spy still doing work. That was a really great shot there from um, the Lava Launcher. The Martyr there is big. And then just let sort of the bloodlust roll. Piercing is also huge. You know, specifically when you're trying to deal with something with the Carnage Titan. You know, overall, great Yasek play. It's really what it came down to here. They will get through the Grum, but it is just too little, too late. Bang. All right. He tied it up. 1-1. One, one. What do we get next? Game number three. Now, I wonder if Wes didn't see the back to basics rule set here. Because he played a sneak. And he played a, looks, what looks like a sneak defender. Because normally, right, you're talking this has flying, good speed. He was going to put some more speed and a shield on it. Um, and so I'm wondering if this was a mistake. You know, maybe I'm wrong and there's some sort of strategy here. Um, but this just doesn't seem like what you would want to play if you knew or if you were aware of the back to basic part of this rule set. You're just putting out, you put out three melee monsters, right? One up front, which is normal, but then two that just couldn't really attack uh, until it was, you know, basically too late. So Guy from Ajax takes this one. I, you know, again, I don't know if it's a slip up. It kind of works better for the drama if you call it a slip up. Uh, so I'm going to call it a slip up. <laughs> so Wes makes an error back against the wall now. Uh, and he needs to figure it out in game four. So game four, lose. Wes gets upset. Guy from Ajax brings back out the Yasek. And as I say, Yasek giveth and Yasek also taketh away. One of the best ways to counter a Yasek is to put an attack focused tank right up front because a lot of these attacks that would normally hit up front you know this is a little different because opportunity snipe uh, and it's super sneak but normally you know if you come out with Yasek and you see like the supply runner and stuff like that those attacks that would normally hit up front are now going to cross all across the back line leaving the demon shark to do work let's see if that's how it plays out in this battle. So it starts off pretty good for Guy from Ajax. Stuff's, you know, he's fast, he's very fast, and stuff's hitting pretty decent spots. So Deep Lurker's gonna be a problem. The Poison lands. You know, the Bakjira is a sneak defender, is a fantastic play. So that's part of the reason why I wonder if Lat's battle, Wes didn't see the back to basics part of the rule set. Um, because he clearly likes to play Sneak Defenders, right? So right now, it's super Sneak. He knows Sneak's coming. He plays that Bakjira. Another great shot here from Sinash. And boom, they get rid of the Deep Lurker by turn two. But Demon Shark just trampling away. You know, and, a lot, and you know, both of these Sneak Attacks are basically worth nothing because of the Bakjira in the back. Sinash again, again, pretty good spot for the Sinash to hit. It's not like, you know, an, a good place to follow it up. 
but here we go. Boom, Demon Shark just ends it. You know, you blink and you miss it. Demon Shark with the with the uh, Stampede rule set just tramples through the whole rest of the team. Boom. Wes takes it back in dramatic fashion. All right. The rubber match. To advance. Can Guy from uh, Ajax do it? Did he, you know, he got handed a gift to go up 2-1. Couldn't take game four. You know, this is normally where the higher seed might grab a stranglehold on the game or on the series. Is that going to be the case here? Let's see. They got a melee, or uh, um, I forget what this is called. Why can I not remember what this is called? Keep your distance rule set. So no melee attacks. Ooh, that double hit, that double giant killer hit. That seems like it was a little important. Although this reach, recharge up front is a good play with the opportunity. Because, you know, a lot of the stuff's going to go to the back line, as you can see. Ooh. That was a brutal shot. I think that one just decided it. That Chaos Dragon to the Chaos Dragon. Yeah, that decided it. Guy from Ajax. The Cinderella story. Looks like it's going to continue. Hold on, I don't want to say it too soon. Yeah, Cinderella story continues. Guy from Ajax. That's right. The 29 seed continues on. Hewitt versus K-Frey. Uh, K-Frey took this one. Um, wasn't that much drama. K-Frey, Hewitt had some good matches back and forth. K-Frey came out on top. All right, now we're going to look at the two seed and the 18 seed. So the one seed already went down. Is there a chance that the two seed, or no, sorry, the one seed didn't go down. Um, the one seed advanced. You know, we have the one, two, and three all still in. Is the two seed going to advance as well? In this one, we're actually going to fast forward to the last match. This went five. So here's what they laid out. Kind of similar teams. They both used Immortalis, and they both started with a Martyr up front. You know, kind of interesting, they both went with some low magic damage, and they both ended up with Void. So there's not a lot of cards that can, um, you know, really do any damage here, and that's going to come up big in this match. All right, so it's funny, right off the bat, if you look at this, the only card that can do damage is the Junboka. He can't attack from here. He can't Bramble Pixie can't attack from the third position. Bramble Pixie can attack from the second position, but not the third position. So it actually takes a while to get through the Fungus Flinger because of the heal. You know, and on the other side, Angelito can only do one damage to their Fungus Flinger. So it's funny, you know, it took basically four rounds just to get through those first two because of the void and low magic damage. All right, so mar both sides got martyred. A martyr Grum. Is that going to be enough? He doesn't have a lot more damage. That was a big miss. He he's got to contend with the flying. Lancey Affliction. That could be huge. Grum, could he finish off here? Oh! It hit the Retaliate. Continues to trample. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of damage dealers left. Oh my goodness. Had just enough damage to get rid of the Grund. He had just enough damage, and now no one can really do damage on the other side. Oof. Wow. Literally one damage away from triggering, an triggering another trample, which may have been the match. Wow, Proton gets the upset. That was wild. That was wild. Uh, in this one, we had another mini upset here. Karnoff took it. He advances to the Elite Eight. Then we gotta show Mondroid some love. So, I haven't shown a Mondroid battle yet. I, he hasn't lost a match yet. And spoiler alert, he's not going to lose here. 
this was to go up 3-0. I'm just going to show because I think it's an interesting strategy. When you have lowish mana poison, a couple interesting cards you can play. Lily to get the triage. And Mandarin to get the triage. So if you can play two low mana triage monsters, Vruz becomes interesting because of the Martyr, too. So stick them in between two monsters. That would get uh, Mandarin up to three attack. And in this case, nine health, which means it's going to heal for three. So it can fully out heal itself um, through the two poison damage. Easy. On top of the uh, triage here. And then this becomes, instead of double, uh, double strike two, you now get double strike three. Doesn't really come down to any of this. It's just he put out too good of a lineup. He's too good of a player. Um, but just wanted to show love to Mondroid. And we get some Vruz content, which I don't think I have shown any yet. Gets the uh, Resurrect. You know, not a bad play from the other side either. Um, you know, the Resurrect's good in Poison. Zenith Monk's good in Poison, specifically for low mana Poison. Low mana Poison's tough. Throw in the Dodge, and that's helpful. Just Lily was a fantastic play. You know, and you mix in that scatter shot too. That just adds some randomness to it. He's able to hit through the dodges. You will see the Martyr ability trigger, not that it really matters here. Redemption will roll through as well. So Martyr triggers before Redemption, that's good to know. A triage keeps the uh, Infiltrator alive, and there's just too much damage on the other side. Mondroid takes it. Cool. And then for the last one on this side, we don't need to talk about it. Uh, some guy named Hawks21 lost three to nothing to Master Shonuff. Uh, it was a very embarrassing performance by this Hawks21 fellow. I don't know who he is. Probably not going to invite him back to my next tournament. Uh, just because, you know, if you're going to be the sixth seed and you're going to lose three to nothing, um, you know, no matter how well your opponent played, I just can't have that in my top level tournament. So. Ox21 is officially on the banned list. Okay. That was fun. But silver was so, so, so much crazier. So much crazier. Before we get into the silver matches, though, we need to talk about our sponsor, Immortal Creed. So, new game. Currently having their pre-sale, Immortal Creed. They have sponsored this tournament. I am greatly appreciative to them. I've talked about this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it because I think it's so unique and it's so amazing. Um, and a big reason why I don't really talk about other games or take sponsorship from other games is because I don't think they have their priorities straight. But Immortal Creed does. Immortal Creed right now, I played a match in the last one. I'm not going to play a match in this one. I'm going to talk about a mechanic. Um, but I will include this link in the description if you do want to play a match. Mortal Creed didn't just roll out his pre-sale and say, here, give us money, here's this asset, here's these assets, and here's this concept we have that maybe we'll make, right? That's what a lot of pre-sales are. Immortal Creed said, here's our pre-sale, also, play some practice matches. Come in here, play the actual game before you decide if you want to spend your money or not. It's an amazing way to do it. Um, you know, the other reason why I like them is they're not spamming people, right? I think they almost made a Twitter account because I said I was going to be tweeting about their game. They just created a Twitter account. They're not going out there and, you know, trying to sell their game to anyone who will listen, try to bring in as much money as possible. No, right now they're focused on building an amazing game and sort of let the word of mouth do the talking. Uh, I think you should join their Discord. I think you should follow them on Twitter. I think you should come in here and play a practice match. Uh, do it. You know, you get to do all of that before you decide if you want to come into the shop and potentially buy some origin packs. There's only 200k available started, so I don't know how many have been purchased, but it's obviously less than that. I've at least bought 120. You know, this was my own money. This wasn't sort of something they gave me. Um, I looked into the game. 
I thought they had their priority straight, like the concept. So I decided to come in here and buy 120 packs early. As always though, do your own research. We are gonna talk about right now, the ranking system in Immortal Creed. I think it's pretty cool. So all players will have a PVP rank and rank level representing their progress in the game. Players will start at novice rank with a rank level of one. So there's almost like two things here, right? Here are the ranks, novice, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, ebony, diamond, legionnaire, vindicator, infinity league. And what's really simple, something you'll notice as we go through this, it's a lot of similar concepts to Splinterlands. I think they just learned from them and made them a bit simpler, right? So there's 10 leagues, 10 card levels. Instead of having to learn this leveling system, you just know, all right, novice is the lowest league, I can play level one. Platinum is the fifth league, I can play level five. Just a lot easier, a lot more linear uh, things you have to know. So, rank level is increased by one for every three PVP matches, one. So, I need to get clarity from them, but my current understanding on this is that there's sort of 10 levels within novice. So you can be like novice one, novice two, novice three, novice four. Once you get up to novice 10, you would then move up to bronze one, and then bronze one, bronze two, blah, 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 and go through. So for every three you win, you'll move up one. Losing matches can lower your rank level. Uh, once their rank level reaches 10, they move up to the next rank, right? So they'll be like novice level one, novice level two, then eventually you go to bronze. Matches in each rank have a maximum card, as we talked about. So again, even the leveling system, right? So you know you have to win three matches to go up to the next one. Simpler version of what Splinterlands offers, right? With the rating point system, you know, you don't really know how much you're gonna get going into a match, if you win, if you lose, whatever. Uh, this is a much clearer what you have to do to advance throughout the game. Talk about match rewards. So. You are awarded for your first 10 ranked match wins each day. So you're going to earn glory, which is their token. Uh, I haven't talked about their token yet. I'll probably get to that before this tournament is over. Um, but you only get rewarded for your 10 matches. I think after that, you could play to advance rank, it sounds like. So, you know, the next day, if you wanted to play your 10 matches at a higher rank, you know, maybe you could play 20 or 30 or whatever in a day to try to move up. Um, I don't know, but that's what it sounds like to me right now. So the base reward is one glory for every level of immortal used, if owned, plus one glory for every level of every owned equipment card used, times the number of turn slots the card fills. Gold foil cards earn twice as much as regular foil. So similar to Splinterlands, gold foil cards earn more. Again, what you're gonna earn is spelled out for you going into the battle. You set your team and you basically know, if I win, I'm going to make this much. And they uh, run through some examples for you. Um, I'm going to go through all this, but it makes sense. It's exactly what they say, how the math works. And then you basically know, going in again, by rank, how much glory you could make. So you're going to want to move up through the leagues to earn more glory. You can play 10 battles total. Um, and yeah, so this is just for standard foil. So you can't really get to boost. Um, you know, I think obviously if you had all uh, gold foil, this would be doubled, but pretty cool. So you know that going into, going into each day, I can play 10 battles to earn. If I win six, this is how much I'll end up with. If I win seven, this is how much I'll end up with. If I win three, this is how much I'll end up with, etc. Very spelled out for you. Very nice. They explain this more. Um, and then they also have season rewards. So much like Splinterlands. At the end of the season, all players who have won at least one battle during the season will receive a portion of the season's rewards. The current season's reward pool starts at base value based on prior season. 5% of all glory spent, oh, this is really cool. So 5% of all glory spent in the shop will be added to the current season's reward pool and 10% of all credits spent in this shop will be added to the pool as glory. So they're basically, you know, the assets people put in the game are then gonna be returned to the players who are already there via season rewards. There's also gonna be reward shares uh, for each match one. A player will accumulate reward shares based on the rank of the match play. A novice rank wins one reward share, bronze two, silver three, etc. So as you go up, you earn more reward shares. The 140 highest rank matches for the entire 14 day season will also award reward shares. 
This averages to the top 10 ranked matches, one per day. They give through some examples as well. Uh, and you can also receive cards and packs. Cool. So yeah, come in here, check out their battle mechanics. Um, they explain their ranking system, match rewards. It's very, very simple. It's all math they give you. Uh, going into each battle, you'll, you know what's going to happen. Uh, it's not a complicated formula. It's not complicated math. Okay, Immortal Creed, thank you for sponsoring. Links will be in the description. Okay, let's head back here. So let's check in on the number one seed again. Uh, going up against good friend of the uh, channel, Hewitt, one of the OG community members. So Hewitt rolls out in match one. And, you know, like the Necromancer, right? You see Kitty. The number one seed can toss out Yoden. We'll just see how this goes. So you see the Gladiator rule set. We get to see him play Crash. So Crash is one of those cards now you're going to be able to work into battles with normal Fire Summoners. And it's a very nice card. Up to 11 speed, Thorns, very hard to hit. And you know, unfortunately, as expected, when you're going up against a one seed, it's not a ton Hewitt can do. It's hit with the, uh, it's hit with the Yoden play. You know, if you don't have Yoden, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And just slowly, RV's makes his way through the lineup. You know, I said there was going to be a lot of drama in silver, but, um, you know, maybe it doesn't happen in this matchup. As you can see, that one finishes off. So we go into match two. Hewitt says, you know what? I'm going to bring an under-leveled summoner. My lob new reward summoner so I can play a gladiator. And I'm bringing out Quora. I got to do it. If you're going to cheese me with Yoden, I got to cheese you with Quora. Not only that, I'm going to bring two martyrs. So you're going to fire my back. The blast is going to kill my taunt, uh, my martyr. I'm going to get some boosts. Eventually you'll get through the fungus flinger. That's going to boost Quora. And, you know, I'm going to use your Yoden blast damage against you. I don't know if it's going to be enough, but uh, we'll see. So there we go. There is the martyr ability up, up. And that's actually pretty big because they're going to have just enough damage, it looks like, to get through the taunt up front. Yep, so one more damage there. They are able to get through that taunt. That's also big because now they have someone who will start attacking the Martyr card in the front. Down goes the Slip Spawn. You know, slowly the damage is creeping away here. Um, valiant effort from Hewitt. But again, if you're just going to go up against Yoden, there's not a lot that can happen. It does get the Martyr, you know, but probably too little too late, right, with all of this blast damage. Nice heal there. So much damage about to come down the pipeline, including the blast. All right, it's just Quora left. I know Quora is great, but how much can Quora do? So much damage, you know, working it down. Oh, wait. Got one Martyr. It's a shield back every time. Interesting. Oh, wait a minute. Quora is just too good. Look at this. Brings the underleveled summoner, brings Quora, and that's all he needs. Hewitt ties it up 1 1. All right. Was able to fight off Yoden. We go into battle three. Has to go up with another top summoner, Queen Mycelia. I mean, Queen Mycelia. Queen Mycelia is what you normally play with, Mylor. Um, Mylor with the Super Sneak. And he says, You know what, Super Sneak, you're expecting me to go melee? I'm going to bring Magic and Ranged. I know you're ready for my melee, so I'm not going to bring it to you. It's a fantastic play by Hewitt to know that your opponent's probably going to expect mad or probably going to expect melee here, and instead say, "I'm going to bring something totally different." You know, this is not a sure thing. It's a it's a tough battle, but he at least gave himself a chance here. We haven't even had the resurrect yet, so they bring back the bear, which is nice. That's gonna refresh everyone's uh, shield. 
helps keep the Curse Mundeku in the back alive a little longer. Ooh, the Giant Killer from the Cabalist. <laughs> the Curse Mundeku's just been hitting a wall back here with the infantry. Not able to do any damage since he got halved. But the dodge ability, he is staying alive back there. So the infantry himself is forced to just keep attacking the Windeku. But yeah, Hewitt gets it done in game two. So again, another top level summoner. But Hewitt kind of knew what was coming. Or knew what his opponent would be expecting at least. And was able to get it done. Alright, so Hewitt up two to one. The one seed goes back against the wall. The one seed brings out the Quora. Hewitt is actually going to use weapons training a little bit here. We'll see if that comes into play. It's very weird to see the Pelicor Conjurer have an attack, but that's what we're going to get here. Look at that. The one magic attack on the Pelicor Conjurer. Something I haven't seen yet. I haven't really seen a good weapons training play yet. And here we got Hewitt rolling one out in a Sweet 16 matchup. Big miss there. There's the attack from the Conjurer. That's incredible. You know, especially when you're going, when you're trying to get rid of someone like uh, Quora, that one extra attack could make all the difference because you got to get it down when you have the opportunity to do it. You can't lollygag with Quora. You have a chance to eliminate it. You got to eliminate it. Here's gets it down to two, up to six. So normally it would be at five. Normally it would be at three. Is the next attack going to be a two? The next attack would have been a two. So one turn earlier got rid of the Quora. I think would have been fine regardless, but still, you know, if they had another heal or something, um, you, you got to get the Quora down when you have the opportunity. So that extra attack from the Conjurer can make all the difference. And it looks like Hewitt's going to do it. Hewitt's going to outlast the Quora. He uses the Quora to get a win. After falling to Yoden in the first match, Hewitt rolls off three in a row to upset the one seed. That's right. Big upset. Hewitt advances. Wow. Okay. That's enough subsets, right? You know, we knocked out the one seed. Let's just sort of roll through some of these other matches really quick. Uh, let's talk about Flavian Noramos. I will never be. Flavian Oramos. Flavian Oramos. There we go. Sorry. It just took me a second. It's a lot of letters. First, the Necromancer. So we know the Necromancer. The one seed in... The diamond tournament you know obviously diamonds probably more of its thing versus silver still 18 we know he's a really good player um you know he should be able to clean up ramos here we're gonna fast forward to game five that's right this series went five as well uh hint, hint that's gonna be a theme as we go through the rest of these matches very interesting we get i always forget this person's name we get the Flying Summoner versus the Flying Summoner in an Earthquake rule set. You know, normally that's the difference. If you have this card and you bring this card, um, you're going to win the Flying rule sets. What happens when you both bring it? So big thing here is the Core Lurker dodged nothing. Ramos rolled off all of those attacks. And not a single one was dodged. It is crazy. I was kind of talking over that, but if we sort of went back and did the percentages, this video is going to be long, so I'm not going to do that. Um, there's no way the odds were that good for all those attacks to hit, especially with the dodge. They all do have the flying, so, you know, it's not like he got the extra flying boost, but that dodge basically just didn't work for him. But yeah, I mean, that's all it took. Once he got through the Lurker... When you build a team based on the Lurker, if it's not able to dodge, you're generally going to be in a bit of trouble, and we see that happening right here. They are able to get through the Jinchawala, but, you know, there's just too much... Oh, wait, actually, just kidding. I forgot about that Resurrect. Um, you know, they should be able to get through it here, but maybe not. Yeah, no, they don't even get through the Jinchawala. Flaviano Ramos. Another upset. The 24 seed takes down the 8 seed. 
I feel like everyone's conspiring against me because I'm paying out. Uh, I'm paying out upsets. So now everyone's like, yeah, let's just have the biggest upsets. Okay, let's get things back in order. We have the four seed versus the 20. Um, yeah, you know, let's let's be realistic here. A couple of these is fun, but do we not have the four seed versus the 20? Looks like I didn't pull up that battle, but it went five and the winner was Danny. Yes, the 20 seed knocks off the four seed. So we've had a 17 over a one, a 24 over an eight, now a 20 over a four. We'll now come here to B Jangles and K Fray. Another fifth game. So I believe all the battles to this point have gone down to a best, it's the best of three series have come down to the fifth game. This is a very weird fifth game, if you notice. Super sneak, but no abilities. They roll out similar lineups. Honestly, what the difference ends up being is up front, K Frey is not. K Frey put a monster up front that could sort of withstand that first attacker's which allowed him to put the Cruel Cethropod in the back to take on more hits before his actual damage dealers started to take any damage. That's really what happened here. You know, because now they're really down to one damage dealer and the Kelp Initiate in the front has withheld uh, versus that one attacker. So K Frey gets it done. I'll just wait for this, just so you can see the Uraeus, clean it up, and now we know it is over. So, another upset. K-Fred. And now, I know I told you Mong uh, Mondroid, the two seed, hasn't lost a match in Diamond. Well, let's just say things went exactly the same here. 3-0. Mondroid looking very strong. We've seen a lot of the top contenders fall off in silver. Mondroid laughed in the face of the competition and said, I'm just going to go 3 0. We don't need to worry about it. Okay. Next, we do the 26 versus the 10. Stop me if you've heard this before. We have a game five. Yes, another series that went to five games. I would love to be able to do this in sort of like a live format. It's obviously difficult coordinating this, um, but if we could just watch all of these series go down to the last game all together, then you can really see how much fun and how exciting Splinterlands is. Um, I've had so much fun sort of watching the battles as they were submitted into me. But here we go, came down to a fifth game. Another opportunity for a big upset. The 26th seed, I believe, Rogue Patton. You know, low mana, melee only. Forgotten One is a fantastic play. Now the Forgotten One needs to hit here. Miss. Miss, uh-oh. Another Retaliate. Miss, oh no. Can't be missing these. The Thorns will clean this up. Oh, that's a big hit. He got the hit he needed. Retaliate. Got the other hit in. Rogue Patton advances. Boom, boom, boom. So look at this. 17 over a one, 24 over an eight, 20 over a four, 12 over a five, still an upset, but just not as crazy as what we've seen. Mondroid, too strong, took care. 26 over a 10. All right. The three seed's got to be in it, right? We're not going to have all double digit in... There's not going to be more 20 seeds in the Elite Eight. I guess that's already true. Or maybe not, actually, because we still have London down here. There's not going to be more 20 seeds in the Elite Eight than there are, you know, single digit seeds, right? Let me introduce you to Game 5. Yes, another Game 5 deciding match. This battle was 
very, very fun. It's impossible for you to know who's going to win this battle until the very end. It took me so long to figure out who was going to win. So a lot of damage here by Wes. But, you know, we talked about before, Hewitt in the Super Sneak didn't go with Melee because that was the expectation. Well, Wes said, I don't care about your expectation. I'm going to bring the extra two health. I'm going to bring an extra melee damage. I'm going to bring a double strike monster. And I'm going to go to town, you know, whether you bring thorns or not. And he brought thorns. He brought an amplify. It's going to be a race against time. Does Wes have enough health to get this done? How does the matchup up front go between Grund and Demon Shark? So again, 10 damage per turn, but Coastal Sentry is going to take 6 damage back. Again, 3 damage going to take 3. 5 damage going to take 3. Just a fascinating matchup. We had 2 misses there from the Grund, so that's big. Two misses from the Grund. Look at that, already down to one health. It's done a ton of damage. It's a race against time. They're doing tons of damage, but those thorns each time are taking their toll. Oh, three misses. The Grund missed three out of four shots. That could have been the difference. Three out of four shots. There goes the Coastal Sentry. Deep Lurker is going to have one more shot in it. Demented Shark's hanging on. Or is it? Ooh, that's a big miss. Credit 64 getting a little robbed here. Oh, that, that's an expected miss. But then the magic damage. He was able to withstand all the melee. But the Phantom of the Abyss. Just too powerful. Wes, the three seed, hangs on. Took him to five. It was a great series. Wes advances. So, joins Mondroid as sort of the expected people to be here. You know, everyone else is a higher seed. Hewitt, you know, you can call this an upset, I guess. But Hewitt, two upsets. Ramos, two upsets. Danny, two upsets. Okay, Frey beat me in the first round. Not an upset. Technically. Um, Rogue Patton, two upsets. We did not have a fifth game in this one. The six versus the 22. The fireworks sort of ended here. Um, yeah, this actually was only three games. As you would probably assume if this series only went three games. That's right. The 22 seed won. Yes. Max Maka took down London 420 in three games. Very, very impressive performance. So look at this. In the Elite Eight for Silver, we have two seeds that are in the top five. Two seeds in the top ten. And we have one, two, three, four seeds that are 20 or higher. The Silver Tournament has been absolutely insane. All these guys who advance to the Elite Eight have earned they're all profitable. They all hit profit profitability after winning, after hitting the Sweet 16. So all these guys are profitable. You throw on all these underdog upset payments that I have to give out because everyone decided to upset their opponent um, in this round. Uh, a lot of people are going to be very profitable playing this tournament. So I'm very glad it's turned out this way. I've had a lot of fun doing this. The people who have played in the tournament, most importantly, have really enjoyed this format. It's run very, very smoothly. I uh, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for the Elite Eight. It should be a lot of fun. Will Mondroid sort of keep never losing a match? Well, you know, it looks like we're gonna have some double digit seeds here playing in the final four. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So stay tuned, video will be out soon. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the content and you've made it this far, uh, first of all, I appreciate you. You're a true supporter. And, you know, you're definitely already subscribed, so I don't have to tell you to like and subscribe. But thanks for being here. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.